video of lecture content rounding out our discussion of perception. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a few more images to get at uh, what we mean by perception. And as a reminder, it's not just the taking in of stimuli, it's also our meaning making, our labeling of them, our understanding of them. Um, and so I'm going to uh, show you some more stimuli and then we're going to talk about perception more generally. So you've seen these already. Let's look at some more. Okay, so hopefully all of you read that and hopefully all of you read the cat. Uh, but what's very interesting is that the central letter in both of these images is exactly the same. The stimulus that you are receiving is exactly the same. But for some reason you are perceiving or identifying or labeling that stimulus as an H in one case and an A in, in the other case. So you're saying the cat. And it's interesting that that happens, that the way we perceive the same stimulus is a little bit different depending on context. Um, what do you see here? You probably see an animal, uh, an elephant, and how many legs does he have? You'll probably say four. But if you look much more closely at it, you'll see that that's a little bit deceptive and it's kind of hard to tell exactly how many feet it has. Let's do one more. And so you probably see both a bridge and ships. And so there's kind of all kinds of these visual illusions all the time that tell us something about perception. And so now I want to talk about perception kind of more generally. And so what do you notice? And so think about these stimuli, but also think about the previous stimuli that you saw on all of these cards. And so overall, we can say a couple of things about perception or how we detect and identify stimuli. And the first is that we want to make meaning out of what we see. And so we don't tend to, I'm going to go back to the first picture of the dog, we don't tend to say, well, this is a random collection of dots. We want to make a story out of it. We want to make meaning out of it. So even if you didn't see the dog right away, you wanted to say, oh, I see something in there. I see something that I recognize. I see a tree. I see a park, what have you. And so the really powerful thing about perception is that it is a meaning-making process. We said that at the beginning. We want to make meaning. We want to understand the stimuli that we perceive. We want to process a whole. So in a lot of the pictures that you saw, rather than saying, well, these are, for example, uh, 20 separate spikes, or these are three little Pac-Mans arranged. We wanted to perceive it as a whole. We wanted to perceive it as a single object. Um, we can also see that in the last example. So instead of saying, well, this is like a line with a squiggle in the middle, and this is kind of two squiggles that are connected by a line, we wanted to see it as a whole thing, right? We wanted to see it as a continuous curve that was then segmented by a straight line. So not only do we want to make meaning, we want to put stimuli together so that it creates a whole. And that's part of what contributes to that meaning. We want to find patterns or organize the information. And so again, I'm going to go back and I'm going to show you what I mean by that. So for example, here, we wanted to say, you know, these are two black lines surrounded by white lines, or this is the letter S. So we wanted to identify a pattern here. We wanted to put the information together. Again, we want to put it into a whole. We want to figure out how information is organized. This is a good example of trying to make something into a whole. So saying, look, these are one, two, instead of saying one, two, three, four, five, six, these are seven lines um, that are kind of arranged next to each other. We want to say this is a whole thing. This is a circle, right? And so we want to find patterns in the information that we encounter. And what, what does that do for us? Well, it simplifies the information to be processed. And we'll talk about why that's important. But we want to organize what we see. We want to put it all together. We want to organize it. And of course, we process information in context. And that's what you see in the cat example, right? So you see the H being processed as an H within the context of the word the. And you see the A being processed as an A within the context of the word cat, even though on paper, these two stimuli look identical, right? And so likewise, for example, with the elephant, we process it in context. So we know that elephants have four legs. So automatically, I'm going to see four legs, even though that may not be exactly what is depicted in this image. 
So what is the advantage of this kind of meaning making in perception? The fact that we see things as a whole, that we organize stimuli. Well, this comes, just so you have the word, uh, from a school known as Gestalt Psychology. And if that sounds German, that's because it is. And so if you remember, um, when I was telling you about uh, Wilhelm Wundt's first lab, I talked about how they were very interested in this perception, and they were interested in discrimination. So how you identified separate stimuli. And Gestalt psychology was kind of the next wave in this field, uh, in the field of perception. If you think about Wilhelm Wundt as setting up his lab kind of turn of the century, 1899, Gestalt psychology emerged about 10 or 20 years later, 1910s, 1920s. We're still talking about kind of a little bit predating behaviorism. So, um, but the study of perception, and so Gestalt, the German word, um, and I don't really speak German, so please correct me if this is not an exact translation but I've always been told that Gestalt psychology means the whole. And so Gestalt psychology was really concerned with a lot of the visual deceptions, um, trompe l'oeil, that I showed you on the past slides, and they were interested in how we process things as a whole. And what are the advantages of processing things as a whole, of making meaning? So for example, I'll direct you to this first image. So it's a lot easier to remember um, a cube with kind of nine boxes all together than it is to remember nine separate individual boxes. And so when I say that we want to make something a whole, when I say that we want to simplify information, when I say that we want to organize information, what that means is that it eases processing. It makes processing much easier and faster for us. And as we talked about with attention, and we'll talk about again when we mention when we talk about working memory, our cognitive capacities are relatively limited. We can't process a ton of information at the same time. Think about attention. Our attention is limited. We can't process very much information at the same time. There's limitations in how quickly we can process information. There's big limitations in how long we can store the information that we processed in working memory. So generally speaking, our cognitive capacities are limited. And so when I simplify information, when I put it together, it makes it easier for me to deal with. It makes it easier for me to process. So for example, if I'm going to ask you, so you've been staring at this image for a while, please recreate both of these images. Which one is going to be easier for you to redraw? All of you guys can probably redraw the nine squared cube right away, the gestalt image, the one that put all the information together. Whereas probably none of you could recreate the exact positioning of all of these boxes. And so the reason that perception functions the way it does, the adaptiveness of the way that perception functions, is that by putting information together, it makes it easier for us to deal with, to recognize, to process, to remember. And so it requires less cognitive resources. The other advantage of perception working the way that it does is that it lets us more easily recognize stimulus. So hopefully all of you guys see that this is a panda. Instead of saying, well, it's a black circle and another black circle, and then there's two black circles kind of in the middle, and then there's kind of black arches, and there seems to be three of them, but one is positioned backwards. We don't perceive things like that. We perceive things as a panda. We want to find meaning. We want to find pattern. We want to say, okay, this is a panda. But in addition to simplifying all of these different disparate stimulants into a single image of a panda, what this helps us do is it helps me better recognize it. What that means is I can take what I already know in interpreting this stimulus. So when I see this panda, I can already say, you know, this is what I know about pandas, and I know that um, pandas live at the zoo a lot of times, and they come from China, and they eat bamboos. That's about all I know about a panda. But it helps me bring relevant information to interpreting the stimulus in front of me, which is really useful, right? So think about if you had to go through the world rediscovering everything all the time, right? So you would wake up and all, you would have to think about, okay, where am I? And you would have to perceive all of the individual stimuli in your room instead of just saying, oh, okay, I'm in my room. You would have to think about what is this? Okay. And so it would just be impossible, right? It's unfathomable to have to rediscover what a bed is every time and rediscover each of the individual objects in your room. So what we can do is we can take our prior knowledge to inform our perception of stimuli. So imagine if a dog walked in right now and so all of you guys would perceive the furry animal and you would say okay that's a dog. 
And not only, and what makes that also easier is that everything you know about a dog applies. So you can say, okay, should I be afraid in this situation or should I kind of walk over and pet it? Is this something that's going to hurt me? So the fact that long-term memory or what we know impacts our perception is really important from an evolutionary standpoint. It's very adaptive because it means that we can deal with our world in a smarter way. So perception makes the world easier to process by grouping information together, and it makes the world make sense because as much as possible, we want to identify new stimuli with what we already know, or we want to recognize stimuli in relation to stimuli that we're already aware of. Okay, so I'm, oop, I didn't mean for that to happen. So I'm going to ask you guys to look for the animal and raise your hand when you see the rabbit. And so what if I say, look for the bird? Hopefully you guys see a duck. And so a duck it has the bill over here and the eye over here, and the rabbit has kind of the mouth over here and the eye over here. And so um, there's kind of different, so depending on what I told you to look for, the duck or the rabbit, you would have seen different things. And so I'm going to show you some more stimuli, and as I show them to you, just kind of read them out. So you probably said the number 135. And here you said the V with a little squiggly line through it. And all of you probably saw a peace sign here. And many of you will probably say, well, that's a Chinese character. But if I asked you, okay, well, which one? You would say, well, it's a straight line and then another dash line going through it and then an upside down V. And those of you in here who speak Chinese would probably realize this. I'm thinking that, if I'm correct, uh, that this is the kanji for a tree. And so those of you who saw this probably said tree if you speak Chinese. But those of you who don't probably said, you know, it's the line and the dash and the V. Okay. So let's talk about what the difference is here. Why is it that when you see this, you say the number 135? Instead of saying, well, there's a straight line and a horizontal line on the bottom and kind of a curved line connecting to it. And then there's kind of two half circles on top of each other. And then there's another half circle and a line on top of it and then another line, right? Why did you say 135 altogether? Whereas here, when you saw the next object, you said, well, this is a V, and then there's a squiggly line going through it. You did kind of break it up like that. But here you didn't break it up. You just said, oh, it's a peace sign. You processed it all together instead of saying, well, there's a line, and then kind of a V going upside down, and it's all in a circle. But here you broke it down again. And so the obvious answer, probably what you said is, well, because I know 135. And so whether or not we know a stimulus, by which I mean we can recognize it, by which I mean it's stored in long-term memory, dictates our perception. So what does that mean? We're going to talk about two types of perception. Those are top-down and bottom-up processing. And I'm going to ask you to take 10 seconds and just based on the words, decide which of these symbols you processed in a top-down versus bottom-up fashion. So kind of just group them. And so hopefully you said that the 135 and the peace sign you processed in a top-down manner, whereas the V with the squiggly and the Chinese character you processed bottom-up, at least for most of you. If you recognize the Chinese character, that would also be top-down processing. So what do we mean by top-down versus bottom-up perception? So we talk about top-down perception as knowledge-driven. What that means is you have the stimulus stored in your long-term memory. So your knowledge or top, kind of the top thinking about like your head, right, is what determines how you perceive it. So you say that this is 135. Whereas bottom-up is also called data-driven. And in that case, perception or your interpretation or your labeling or recognition of the stimulus is not driven by your knowledge. It's driven by the data. It's driven by the stimulus itself. And so here I'm labeling it 135 because that's the label for the system that's stored in my long-term memory. 
Whereas here, I'm breaking this down because I'm really interpreting the symbol. And in fact, if you look at the V with the squiggly line, what I did was I broke it down into the smallest units that I recognize. So I didn't say it's one kind of angled line and another angled line. I said, oh, it's a V. And so that's the smallest meaning making unit that I recognize. And another way to think about top-down versus bottom-up processing, what it means is that we tend to process when we have the stimulus in our long-term memory, we process it as a whole. So thinking back to the panda, we process that as a single stimulus, as the whole. Whereas in bottom-up processing, we process the parts. So thinking about this tree symbol, we processed each of those components separately because our processing was driven by the specific stimulus. And of course, the next question I'm going to ask you is kind of, which is better? And so we need both, and we used both all the time. But we tend to think about top-down processing as much more efficient. It happens a lot faster because we have the information stored in long-term memory. So we don't have to construct this as a whole. And so we just perceive it as a whole. Whereas, and so the cognitive processing of that is much faster. Whereas bottom up, we have to think about all of the pieces and how they fit together, which is a lot less efficient. And if I were to ask you to reconstruct all of these symbols, you would have a lot of an easier time reconstructing the top down versus the bottom up symbols. But we use both types of perception all the time. Just top down perception is faster, easier, it's more efficient. So you recognize symbols that you know faster than symbols that you don't know. And so going back to our IP theory, here it is for us. Um, I have perception here as kind of very separate from long-term memory. But in fact, we can think about long-term memory or where we store information, where we store what we know as guiding perception. I'm not going to draw the arrow on here. But when we're talking about top-down processing, we're talking about information in long-term memory guiding our perception. And the example I like to give, and I didn't animate this, but if I were to show you this, um, this animal surrounded by um, Easter eggs, you would see it as a bunny. Whereas if I showed you this animal and I drew a little pond around it, you would see a duck, right? And so our perception is guided by our long-term memory, is guided by what we know. And so as you saw in the Chinese symbol examples, and a lot of that is cultural. So the reason that you associate Easter eggs with a bunny, even though ducks lay eggs and bunnies don't, is because of our cultural knowledge. Because we know that, um, because we know based on our culture that the way we celebrate Easter is with bunnies and eggs. And so our perception is in part guided by our long-term memory, by what we know, and in part guided by the impulses themselves when we're talking about bottom-up processing, the specific sensations that we experience. And so when we come back together, we're going to move to kind of the next stage of the model, which is working memory. And so before you go, turn to your neighbor and give them the difference, a one difference between top-down and bottom-up processing. And I will see all of you next Wednesday. There's no class on Monday because of Labor Day.